Right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Bryce Wakefield. I'm um, the National Executive Director of the Australian Institute of International Affairs, but today I'm a speaker. So um, I'll just briefly introduce our moderator. Our moderator is Alan Gingell. A lot of you already know him. He's the national president of the Australian Institute of International Affairs, was the founding director of the Lowy Institute, and was also the uh, the Director General of the Office, Office of National Assessments here in Canberra. So, Alan, please um, take it away. Thanks very much, Bryce. There's certainly a lot going on in the world at the, the moment for, uh, for us all to manage. Everything from the withdrawal from Afghanistan, um, the announcement of the new AUKUS arrangement, so uh, quad meetings in person in Washington. But I'm really delighted to be able consequential election which is coming up and hasn't had the coverage in Australia that it deserves. On the, um, on the surface, this is an election for a party position that is president of the Liberal Democratic Party of Japan. But given the LDP's political dominance, it will almost certainly reveal to us uh, who will be Japan's prime minister after the general election, which is coming in, uh, coming in um, November. Uh, the election for, for president of the party became necessary following the unexpected uh, decision by the current prime minister, Yoshihide Suga, Suga uh, not to recontest the position uh, in the face of disappointing um, public opinion polling and losses at some recent uh, by-elections. Prime Minister Suga, of course, had only been there for a year following on from the also so unexpected uh, resignation for health reasons of the long-serving Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. The four candidates uh, announced for this uh, position are a surprisingly diverse uh, group, um, particularly because it includes uh, two women. And the outcome, as I understand it, but we're going to hear about that uh, imminently, is, uh, is not, not yet clear. The candidates are Kishida Fumio, who is a party faction head and a former Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, Takeichi uh, Sanai is a former Minister of Internal Affairs and Communications. So she's one of the two women. She's backed by former Prime Minister Abe and uh, has some, some of his um, uh, robust uh, ideas. Konotaro is current Minister for Administration and Regulatory Reform, best known in Japan at the moment for being the minister responsible for the COVID vaccine rollout. And he's also a former Minister of Foreign Affairs as well as Defence. And finally, another woman, Noda, Noda Seiko, uh, who is uh, uh, another former Minister of Internal Affairs and Communications. Um, of course, this, this election has important implications uh, for Australia. It's hard to think of a challenge facing our country over the next, uh, well, indefinite future, I suppose, but let's just take the next uh, three, three years, uh, ranging from the strategic situation in North Asia, uh, to the prospects for our own and the global economy, uh, to what, what happens about climate change, which doesn't involve Japan and in which uh, Australia's relationship with Japan is not going to be uh, important. Um, as the author of a, uh, of a book about Australia and the world since 1942, I'm sometimes asked about the success stories in Australian foreign policy. And for me, the first thing that comes to mind is always the successful management by both Canberra and Tokyo under successive governments of a relationship which has been transformed during my own lifetime from, uh, from bitter uh, disagreement following the, uh, the war to a close and trusting partnership. And the important thing uh, about it for me is that the, uh, this transformation is not just something which has happened 
And it's much more deeply embedded in the community, business community, um, uh, civil society. As you can see in, in the very warm views of Japan, which come up regularly every year in the Lowy Institute's uh, survey of public, uh, public opinion. So we're very lucky to have with us today a great panel of export experts to uh, talk about these matters. In order of speaking, they're going to be uh, Dr. Bryce Wakefield, the National Executive Director of the Australian Institute of International Affairs, uh, Professor Haruko Sato, uh, specially appointed professor at the Osaka School of International Public Policy, where she teaches uh, Japan's relations with Asia and, uh, and identity in international relations. Uh, Richard Katz, a long observer of Japan, a special correspondent at Weekly Toyo Kazai, a leading Japanese business weekly. And finally, joining us um, very soon, I gather from a, a graduation uh, ceremony, Professor Yoichiro Sato, a professor at uh, Ritsumakan Asia Pacific University. He's uh, another friend of the AWIA who has contributed to many of our recent uh, And over to you, Bryce. Right. Thank you, Alan. Um, I think you guys can all hear me very well, although I'm I seem to be shorting out a bit. Um, uh, it's it's great to be here. It's great to see uh, quite a few people coming in and um, to see quite a few uh, friendly names, not faces, friendly names uh, of people who uh, are in the sort of Japanese politics scholarly community um that's it's great that you're here um we we did actually set this up or i did <laughs> set it up as uh, a kind of primer on japanese politics for a largely australian audience but it's great that uh, we're, we're going to be able to um talk to you um so i'll start i guess with a quote by eleanor roosevelt who of course said that um Great minds discuss ideas, average minds discuss events, and poor minds discuss people. And I think today I'll squarely fall in the category of the poor minds, because it's up to me, I think, to give some background on the candidates. But before I do this, I want to discuss the quote unquote election. And I say quote unquote, of course, because as Alan has already mentioned, we're not talking about an election in the terms of a general election where the public can vote, but um, a selection process by a party. Um, the rough and tumble of inter-election selection processes um, is perhaps not so familiar to Australians, um, whose prime ministers are, are sometimes deposed between elections by spills, or as they're called elsewhere, coups, where a leader suddenly finds that he or she doesn't have the numbers. And I don't think it's worked like that in Japan for at least two decades. Um, Prime ministers usually resign due to scandal. They claim they're sick, or in the case of Fukuda Yasuo, indeed, um, Suga Yoshide, because they're fed up with their job. Um, and it's usually clear who their successor will be. And indeed, most general elections uh, since 1955 haven't been particularly important in terms of, uh, of, of deciding who the prime minister would be. Um, and that's, of course, partly because of LDP dominance, the dominance of the Liberal Democratic Party since that time. Um, electoral reform in the 1990s has perhaps weakened that dominance. But even if we take the last 20 years or so as our guide, I don't think there was actually a general election that wasn't a foregone conclusion in terms of the leadership. And in addition to that, when we look purely at the party elections, there are only two, two elections, I think, in the past 20 years, although the first one is perhaps debatable, um, 2001 and 2012, which were, um, which, which any reasonable observer of Japanese politics might not have predicted who was next in line to lead the LDP. So I think what we're seeing at the moment is a genuine contact test for leadership. And that's been highly unusual, um, especially in the last 20 years. And that absence of competition, coupled with the rule of, very, uh, of two very strong leaders at the helm of the LDP for most of the time that the LDP has been in power for the last 20 years or so, has led some observers to proclaim um, from time to time that LDP factionalism or the old practice of 
um, of faction heads meeting behind closed doors to to decide who the leader is is over. And I'm not sure I agree with that completely. We're seeing in this election less cohesion around factions as younger members of the Diet seek to gain influence um, and, and, and they're not necessarily um, considering voting along factional lines. And I think, um, I think though, that what we are seeing now um, in, in I, I, would, I would disagree with the notion that factions don't matter, but I think they do matter. And the way those factions line up behind various candidates the way that faction heads signal that they're going to be supporting this or that candidate may have an effect on the outcome of the election and will have an effect on the prime minister's ability to lead. So to briefly introduce the candidates, um, Ellen's done it already, but I will as well. Um, there are, as Ellen has said, four candidates, uh, two of them are men and two of them are women. Now, um, we might be encouraged by the fact that there is some gender balance in the race until we realize that one of those women, um, Nora Seiko, has practically no chance of winning the top job. And the other woman in the race, Takaichi Sanai, has almost no chance of winning the top job. However, they are important in the race, and I'll explain why in a little bit. But first, uh, to the two lead candidates, Kono Taro and Kishida Fumio. In terms of public opinion, Kono is the more popular of the two. He's got about 40% of popular support. Doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean anything in terms of party support. He does not lead his own faction, however, and is therefore somewhat reliant on the support of Asotaro, the current um, deputy prime minister and his faction chief. But um, Aso is actually pretty tepid in support for Kono. And this might be because Kono is something of a political maverick. He tends to make his own decisions, not conferring with the factions of his own party. Some of his positions are more liberal than a lot of his LDP colleagues. So for example, he supports gay marriage and the right of women to keep their surname, uh, which seems like a strange issue, but it's an important issue to a lot of Japanese people. And it's through these issues as well as his push for digitization and administrative form, reform, that Kono has cultivated a kind of popular image. He's a kind of new leader and he can cater to pop popular opinion. He communicates a lot directly to the people through Twitter, for example, right? And this is perhaps one of the reasons why the faction heads don't seem to particularly like him. Um, mm. As I've said, even Asol, the head of his faction is pretty tepid. Um, and most of the faction heads have told their members that they can vote for who they like in this election. And so um, that's been interpreted to mean that um, that the faction that the faction, you know, that factions don't don't matter anymore. But another interpretation of that is that if faction heads aren't coalescing around a front runner early on, that means they don't like that front runner. Now, the only candidate who is also a faction leader is Kishida Fumio. He has his own faction. Um, he's the other front runner, but he only has 18 to 20% of the popular support. Um, now, the other panelists, Rick uh, Haruko and uh, Yoichiro, will no doubt speak to the policy differences between the candidates. But I think one of the major differences between Kishida and Kono is their public profile. Um, Kishida has been trying very hard to sort of present himself like Kono as a kind of popular actor, appealing to new voices in the parliament, to the extent that he's actually been fighting with older faction heads about the level of influence that factions should wield. Um, but these um, efforts to position himself as a man of the people come off as a bit forced, given that he's the head of his own faction. Now, as I've already mentioned, there's a third candidate with a slight chance of winning, and that's Takaichi Sanai. She has about 15% popular support. However, her platform, I think, has limited appeal as she is an extreme nationalist. And she advocates, for example, that politic politicians should pay their respects at Yasukuni Shrine, whereas a lot of you will know war criminals have been enshrined. She advocates strongly for constitutional change, particularly for change to Article 9, the, the batting war clause, and for a strong military capability. Um, she's the strongest advocate in the field for Japan to develop its own mis missile strike ca capability, for example. 
Takeichi does not have the support of any factional leaders, but she does have the support of Abe Shinzo, the former prime minister of Japan, and it's hard to figure out what Abe's game is here. One explanation is that Abe likes to throw his weight in behind nationalist causes when they don't carry much political consequence, frankly. Um, my interpretation of Abe is that he is a pragmatist most of the time, actually, and only really panders to his nationalist base when it's politically convenient uh, to do so. The other read is that Abe, who is not a faction head, but closely associated with the um, Hosoda faction, which is the LDP's largest faction, is like the other heads, would not be happy with Connor winning, or at least would not be happy with Connor winning outright. And what may be the case, I think, is that the faction heads are trying to split the field, which is why Nora Seiko's emergence is also important because she siphons the vote, uh, the, the liberal vote, if you like, so that Connor does not win an outright majority. And it looks like that's going to happen. That's probably going to be the outcome on Saturday. Uh, is it Saturday? Uh, if, if not Saturday, on the 29th. Um, if that happens, and it is now likely to happen, um, the election will go to a runoff between um, Kishida and Kono. And in runoff elections in the LDP, only LDP diet members, not the general membership, can vote. Right, And that's important because if that happens, then the factions come back into play with each faction head controlling their group. Kono or Kishida, or Kono or Kono or Takaichi, whichever one it is, um, will need to renegotiate their victory or negotiate their victory. And while both have said that they will not take factional considerations into the formation of their cabinets, they will nonetheless probably have to make important policy concessions or um, concessions in terms of the roles uh, for individual faction members within, within important committees in uh, the party. So that then, um, that then leads to um, an effect on the ability of the Prime Minister to lead. And I'll leave it there. Ellen. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Bryce. We'll now uh, turn it over to uh, uh, Haruko Sato. Hey. Hello. Hello, everybody. And um, thank you for inviting me to this uh, very interesting event and also um, I think I am very grateful that this topic as Alan mentioned earlier uh, is getting uh, the attention that it probably uh, deserves uh, not because I don't know how consequential it is to uh, for example Japan Australia relations uh, however uh, I do think that this election not so much the result but the process of two with which it came to become a contest uh, is deeply consequential to um, in, in the longer sort of span of Japan's uh, social changes. And to, um, I'm basically, because I have other experts uh, on other issues about Japan, I actually want to shed light to um, what Bryce also mentioned about uh, these two women candidates, uh, Takaichi Sanai and uh, Noda Seiko, and uh, why their presence uh, is important and what sort of uh, things that we can read from the, the, the relatively different policy positions they take and also what that means within the entire sort of identity of the Liberal Democratic Party. Because um, yes, they have been in rule since 1955, they've been dominant. However, I think the Liberal Democratic Party has also gone through a crisis and renovation. And also um, with at the expense of the, the voters becoming very apathetic. Um, I would like to, to sort of alert uh, the, the Australian audience today that um, the, the Liberal Dem if, if you look at the polls, recent polls right after Prime Minister Suga resigned or decided not to contest in the, in the presidential race, that over 60% of the voters are floating voters. This is very, very high. And also, 
our voting turnout uh, in, on election days have been very, very low in the past few elections. And the one most recent election that we, the, the local election we had over the, the mayor of uh, Yokohama, -shi, Yokohama City, um, this actually uh, was, I think, the litmus test uh, for Prime Minister Suga because that is his con constituency. He was supporting uh, a candidate who is the son of Suga-san's former boss, uh, Okondogi-san, uh, who was also a politician. And, and yet um, the, the citizens of Yokohama basically went and chosen a doctor. Uh, who had no political experience in the past. And also uh, what's quite noteworthy is that the voting turnout, the voter turnout was also quite high, which meant that I think these floating voters sort of had to make sure that certain things, for certain handling of COVID, uh, the Liberal Democratic Party's way had to be punished. Um, and I think another, Thing that everybody probably should uh, note is that um, Japan, of all the G7, G8, or uh, wealthier countries, is the only country where prime ministers resigned twice or changed hands during this pandemic. Um, and I think Abesan's throwing in the towel last year, around this time last year, was shameful. Um, and I think this was the COVID-19 crisis was really more of a national security crisis that he and his focus on defense issues uh, and his team of people were clearly not ready or capable or even conceptualized as a security threat and um, just basically left it to the health ministry and the local authorities uh, to handle. And then now comes uh, Suga-san, who obviously for holding the Olympics and so on and so forth. And he thought that he could ride on the success of holding the Olympics in spite of COVID-19. He might be able to sort of ride on the coattails of that success to, be, to extend his term. But obviously these things weren't working. So I think there is some, as I said in the very beginning, the process with which uh, we came to this point of having a presidential election uh, of the, Liberal, the ruling party is quite important. But moving on to that sort of longer theme of social change, uh, another thing about this, the, um, this election actually is also quite important for the Liberal Democratic Party itself, because as uh, both Alan and Bryce have mentioned, it, it actually is precedes a general election. So the Liberal Democratic Party needs a face uh, around which uh, they can get the votes and to be in the ruling party. And I don't doubt at all that they will be in, 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 as a ruling party, although in what sort of majority, we don't know. But the kind of so the, the, the focus of this election is actually also important because the, the, the policies that are being contested and watched are mainly social and economic policies. And of course, you might say that, yes, well, those are usually the issues uh, that any domestic election is about. But if you remember, with Abesan, it was always something bigger about, you know, state identity, ideology, uh, all the rhetoric about beautiful country and all of that. And so in a way, it was sort of less to do with concrete politics or policies. And, but this time around, um, these four candidates have very, uh, have come out with uh, social, pol social and uh, economic policies that are grounded in different value systems. And uh, so I've just, and Bryce has already mentioned about these two women candidates, Noda Seiko and Takaichi Sanae, who actually do come from very different sort of uh, political values points of view. And that surname thing is very 
important. I'll just explain that in a minute. But these things in a historical context is, I would be a, a venture to say that it is about uh, modern Japan's sort of a, a contestation between continuities from pre-war Meiji Japan when Japan became a modern state and adopted Western values and so on, and sort of gave rise to the current sort of conservatism. And another Japan that is post-industrial, it's had its success, and now it, you know, the society is more affluent, it's more diverse, and it occupies a certain place in the world in which Japan is expected to be on the side of democracies, on the side of progressiveness, of, of social values and tolerance, and for example, on the side of being a lot more helpful in say migrant issues. So these, these two things are, um, they, they are not, not one of them are, is dominant over the other, but Takaichi Sanai and uh, Noda Seiko, I think they represent these two uh, waves, if you will. Um, and Takaichi Sanai is, I think, you know, he, Bryce uh, um, has already said that she's very nationalistic. When she was the Minister of Internal Affairs, she was the one who was trying to put a gag order on the, the commercial uh, television stations saying, if you don't uh, uh, report neutral, politically neutral news, then we can revoke your broadcasting license. Uh, so this is the kind of a bit of an authoritarian tendency, and that's where she is. Noda Seiko is a very uh, un, miss, uh, sort of under-studied uh, um, person, but she was actually also uh, in what is called the 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 head of the policy coordination at the Liberal Democratic Party, which actually does require a lot of political skills, finesse and actually they have to be a little more savvy. And so she does have a lot of experience, um, but, and she has, I think this is the seventh time she's attempting uh, to run for this race. But these two can, um, one of the striking thing about uh, the two of them, and I will explain the surname issue, why this matters, uh, is that Takai Tsunai goes for the traditional values of, you know, Japanese women should actually marry into the family and family which should be the most important unit in society. Uh, whereas um, Noda Seiko uh, and a lot of other uh, female politicians in different uh, opposition parties as well, they take a very different, well, actually more of a natural progressive view about these very archaic civic laws uh, that have basically been in place uh, before, you know, uh, before the war. So this is another, this is an example of this pre-war Meiji Japan, uh, the continuity surviving and being challenged by uh, other more sort of uh, progressive uh, post-war Japan uh, values. And why this is very consequential is because uh, when people start, when women started to work uh, a lot more in, you know, in the 80s and the, in the 90s, and particularly in uh, for, uh, in um, uh, overseas positions or as journalists, basically what happens is that if you marry, uh, then you adopt, you change your, but if you're married while you're still working, you would be more inclined to keep your professional name. Uh, that you have started to build your reputation on. So this applies to like journalists, politicians, business leaders, and so on and so forth. But what happens if when you marry and but your name on the passport, for example, uh, becomes your husband's name? And what people like Noda are saying is that if you don't allow your, you know, if, if you don't allow us to keep our surnames, it becomes Number one, things like a security problem uh, at you know uh, international gatherings, or particularly in, at immigration, or even security checks, because there you know your name on the say participants list or whatever does not match your passport name. 
So these kind of practical issues have been raised time and time and time and again. Um, and there is no uh, plausible explanation uh, coming from the conservative side when you know, it's really actually less to do with a sort of uh, individual identity or empowerment of women. But these issues, there's many, many practical consequences uh, for keeping this rather draconian, archaic uh, law over surnames. Um, and so what I, I don't want to sort of uh, make this uh, a central uh, point of, of my sort of talk about uh, the election today, but I do like you to understand that what we are seeing is finally mm -hmm. a society that is trying to express uh, its change and an LDP that is trying also to find its relevance in a 21st century Japan. So I'll end it here. Thank you. Thanks very much, Professor Sato. Um, a lot for us to come back to there. Could I now uh, turn to Richard uh, Katz and ask you to, uh, to speak to us, Richard? Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a, it's a pleasure to do this. Um, I think, uh, you know, we were talking a little bit earlier before everybody else got on about, you know, why would someone want to be prime minister with all the challenges that uh, Japan faces, at least on the economic side? Um, and none of these problems, in my view, are, are unmanageable, but they are very serious problems and they need a strategy. And the thing that I find among all four candidates is, is that none of them actually have an economic strategy. They've not spent their careers focusing on economic issues. Uh, they don't have, uh, as far as I can tell, and I've asked a lot of other people as well, they don't really have sort of a brain trust around them of, of advisors, individual advisors, the way that Shinzo Abe did, for, for example, which means that while they have pet some particularly uh, particular issues they're focused on, They don't have an overarching view of economic strategy, which is likely to mean that the LDP leadership and the bureaucracy, the Bank of Japan, the Ministry of Finance, etc., will hold sway on these issues more than the prime minister. And I think that uh, the danger there is, is one of, of inertia. Um, Abenomics, in my view, was a political triumph and an economic failure. And we can go into the, in the Q&A why I think that. But the fact is, he did not keep his promise to raise the rate of growth. Living standards, real wages, medium household income have all continued falling under Abenomics. Um, and so uh, there were not three arrows that he promised, but sort of only monetary policy, and that didn't work. Uh, we can get into that in the, the Q&A. So that it, if they talk about you know, some variation on Abenomics, again, it, it doesn't really have a strategy to move Japan forward. Now, what are some of the issues that whoever is elected, the challenges that they're going to have to face? Well, the most immediate challenge is the impact of COVID on the economy. Um, and we see in the COVID case and in the case, just like we saw in the global economic crisis in 2008, 2009, there are a number of these cases where there is a global crisis and the actual crisis in Japan itself. The financial crisis was not a big financial crisis in Japan 10 years ago, yet Japan's economy was hit very, very hard. The level of, of deaths from COVID and cases of COVID and hospitalization has actually not been bad by, by international standards. And yet it was so badly mishandled that uh, it has really, really hurt the economy quite badly. And so this speaks to issue one is the, the prime minister has to address that. And they've all said they're gonna keep the monetary stimulus they've had before. They're gonna keep on going with the fiscal stimulus. They're sort of putting off any budget balancing to put a cushion under the economy. And that's the right thing to do to prevent it's sort of that's damage control. But, but going forward, what are the issues in a strategic sense they have to, they have to deal with? Well, one is, you know, we've had, Japan has had three decades now, which are lost decades, where growth has been very, very low. 
living standards have fallen, real wages for workers have fallen. Uh, of the 29 OECD countries between 2007, that is just before the global economic crisis and 2019, so before COVID hit, of these 29 countries, Japan came in 29th in growth and GDP per worker. Now, why is that important? Well, there are only two sources of economic growth, which is growth in the number of workers and growth in how much each worker can produce. Well, Japan is, is the working age population is shrinking. So the only source of growth in Japan is if each worker produces more each year than did before. And while there's some increase, the rate of growth, productivity, output per worker has been very, very low. As I said, 29th out of, out of 29 countries. So an issue of how do you actually revive growth is, is, the, is the issue. And lack of growth makes every other issue much more less manageable. Obviously, aging is a big, big issue in Japan. People over 65 are now 30% 30, 30 of the entire population. Most of the growth in the workforce has actually been people over 65 who could not afford to retire. The people over 65 without jobs, particularly single women, uh, suffer uh, a lot. The poverty rate is really, really quite, quite high. So that is a, how do you handle aging? How do you pay for pensions? How do you pay for health care? Um, inequality, again, is, a, is an issue people talk to about. The two biggest sources of inequality in Japan, which used to be one of the most equal rich countries in the world, is no longer. 40% of the labor force are what are called non-regulars. The labor force has been divided into two parts. It used to be uh, people had what was called lifetime employment, um, which is the, uh, and they had certain benefits from having that and secure, so security against mass layoffs. Well, now 60% are in that traditional employment system. 40% are non-regular workers, which means their pay per hour is about a third less than regular workers. They're not entitled to some of the, th the benefits that regular workers get in terms of how unemployment compensation works, pension benefits, uh, uh, bonuses, which are a big, large part of income. Fortunately, there is a national health care system, so they are covered by that. The other big, so that's a one big source of inequality. The other big source of inequality is, as I said, seniors who, who are no longer working, and particularly when it's a single person. And a lot of seniors have had to move in with strangers, not even health members of strangers because their children don't take them in for various reasons and uh, they can't afford to live by themselves. Many of them live in towns which have actually, the towns have grown, have shrunk so much that, and this is all over Japan, thousands of towns, affecting millions of workers and it's going to get worse, that a town, for example, can no longer raise enough revenue to maintain the, the sewer pipes and this corrosion. They can no longer um, support a supermarket. So where are they going to get their groceries? One very uh, entrepreneurial fellow developed a, a company that takes trucks, goes to village to village, and actually delivers food there. And it's quite a rising business. And it was somebody, a new entrepreneur who thought of it, the traditional supermarkets which should have thought of it, uh, did not. But this depopulation of towns is a big, big issue. Um, Clearly, the, the climate change, I'm raising all these issues, not in any particular order of priority. The problem is they're all very, very important and they're interconnections among them. But climate change is clearly the issue. You know, people are talking about all the economic damage to Japan because of the supply chain damage from COVID, particularly affecting automobiles. Well, the supply chain, the supply chain damage from flooding and heat waves and, and electrical out, uh, uh, blackouts because of, of short electricity from, from climate change will make COVID look like nothing. Suga, to his credit, took a big stance to move Japan more forthrightly into that issue. And Kono is very, very committed to that issue, very aggressive. And really it's, it's a political issue now of whether in fact Japan will follow aggressive policies. So far, uh, while well, many, many forward-thinking, hundreds of forward-thinking leading companies are for much more aggressive action, the Kedon Business Federation, which is the leading and most powerful business federation, 
uh, linked to heavy industry and, and, and the fossil fuel industry. And METI, who pays more attention to, to those sides of things, have been in the resistance forces against taking aggressive action. So for example, SOGA had promised we're going to reverse our policy in coal, but there's no reversal. Um, you know, METI, when they issued their plan for um, strategic plan for 230, said coal will still be 20% of Japan's electricity source by 2030. Well, unless Japan takes steps by the next 10 years, the idea of getting to net zero by 250 is a pipe dream. And this shows METI is resistant. Uh, the re Q and A, but I want to give an overview here. The renewal ambition is, is really quite quite uh, limited. It's better than it was before, to be sure, but not enough. <clears throat> and then there's this dream that they're going to raise nuclear power back to 20% of electricity. It's now about 6%. That's not going to happen. And what it doesn't happen, what are they going to use to fill the gap? More coal, more liquid uh, LNG, natural gas. So that's a that's a that's a really a, a, a big issue. And the final thing was that, uh, and this is, a, is this issue of so-called digitization. One of the big problems in Japan is that Japanese companies, and Japan as a country was very, very competitive, very strong when we were in the analog era of where big capital intensive, rich companies, that they did everything by themselves without collaborating with other companies. When that was the leading edge of competition, Japan mm -hmm. did great. Sony, Toyota were on top of the world. We're now in a digital era where even smaller companies can succeed. Our biggest giants, in fact, collaborate. There, there are webs of networks of companies that collaborate on all sorts of issues, including Amazon or Facebook or those types of companies. That's not something Japan has done. Um, Japan has come in out of all the countries in the world about not how much they invest in information and communications technology, but how much benefit they get from those investments because how how cleverly they use them to change things. Japan came in 56th, which is shameful for a country which is so technologically adept, but has not been able to apply this to business practices. So Japan is lagging, and I'm sorry, getting rid of Hanko, the, the seals that people use to stamp documents, or replacing the fax machines with, with email in government operations, that does not fix the economy. It's necessary, but it is so insufficient. Um, and so there are a whole bunch of challenges and, my, and, and all of them are in my view solvable. They're absolutely solvable. There are political obstacles, but economically they're solvable. But that needs a prime minister who actually acts as a leader, has a strategy, doesn't have to know these issues himself, but has to have people around him that he or she trusts who are independent of the bureaucracy and the LDP. And, and that I'm, I'm afraid is not the case for for any of these, these four. And so I think we'll see a lot of inertia on economic issues. So let me stop there. I probably spoke too long anyway. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Richard. That was a sobering, uh, sobering ac uh, account. Uh, I'll give the good uh, news in the Q and A if anybody wants some good, good news. Good, good. Uh, I'll ask you about that. Um, uh, now, let me welcome uh, Professor Yochiro Sato uh, and uh, ask uh, you to give us some good news, perhaps, Professor. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to see uh, the Australian audience. Uh, I'm not sure if I have a great good news or not, but uh, I'll talk about the uh, prospect in terms of uh, foreign policy and security policy in uh, uh, post Suga Japanese leadership. Uh, the Bryce has mentioned uh, and carefully avoided making a solid prediction. And I think that's the right attitude because whoever makes a uh, you know, solid prediction, uh, prediction about the Japanese election, they end up you know, <laughs> being wrong. And, this is a really a complicated issue right now. And I think we will really have to pay attention to a lot of uh, daily news items and, and also uh, the gossips uh, published in those magazines and the tabloid type uh, publications because that's where you get the most juicy stuff and, and those juicy stuff uh, 
predictably include a lot of leaked material by some of the candidates themselves or their backers. So it will be a very interesting uh, weeks ahead of us. But anyway, uh, I'd like to point out a couple of things. And I think the US and other Quad members are very keenly looking at this leadership selection because they are very concerned that uh, Japan might be going back to the days of unstable political leadership. A lot has happened under Abe and he passed the national security legislation in 2015 and based on the reinterpreted uh, Article 9 of the Constitution, allowing a room for collective defense participation by the self-defense forces. And this opened up uh, not only a closer US-Japan defense cooperation, but also uh, Japan's growing uh, security partnerships with uh, other US allies. And here I emphasize most notably with Australia. Japan and Australia have a, a very cordial relationship for a long time. And uh, the two plus two meetings between uh, Australia and Japan uh, started even before Abe. And uh, it has a long history of cooperations uh, mainly starting from uh, the UNPTO participation in Cambodia during which Japan dispatched the self-defense force and some civilian components and, and Australian troops uh, worked uh, very closely with the Japanese under the PKO umbrella. And the similar pattern uh, was repeated in the East Timor dispatch and, and in Iraq and in the maritime domain, the, uh, the, the operation uh, Enduring Freedom against the Taliban's, uh, the smuggling attempts, the naval uh, refueling activity by the Japanese corporation, uh, I mean, Japanese self-defense forces uh, in cooperation with Australians and many other uh, US allies and friends. Those are the precedents which built, cumulatively built the Japanese-Australia defense partnership. And, and we are entering a period in which the, the militaries from both Australia and Japan are closely exercising. The new partnerships are expanding beyond Australia and now India, UK, France, Canada, they all have strategic partnership agreements uh, with Japan, most of which were signed during the Abe administration. And those partnership agreements uh, come with the regularized two plus two meetings and also with the uh, uh, AXA, the acquisition and cross-servicing agreements which are necessary when two militaries from different countries uh, uh, jointly work in uh, high frequency. But even Australia even went ahead by signing uh, uh, the reciprocal uh, force agreement uh, between Australia and Japan. So that the uh, assumption is that the presence, mutual presence of troops on the counterpart soil are uh, uh, anticipated in the coming years. So two countries have made uh, adequate preparation to uh, deal with this uh, closer defense partnership. All of those happened under Abe and Suga pretty much succeeded, carried on all of it. But the Suga administration uh, anticipatedly is ending uh, right now. Well, 
Suga is attending the, the Quad Summit meeting uh, as one of his uh, last uh, jobs to do. Well, good thing Suga is a lame duck outgoing prime minister because otherwise he wouldn't be able to make a trip at this timing. But uh, uh, why would the US wanted Suga to come? Uh, it's very important that uh, the US in particular, but uh, other Quad partners also upgrade Japan's commitment to the growing collective defense at the summit level. The foreign ministers level face-to-face -face meeting happened, but uh, the, at, the, at the summit level, uh, this, is, this is going to be the first time. So it's very symbolic and it sends a very strong message to not only other countries, but to Suga's successors that we are watching Japan to continue to grow as a reliable security partner don't slow down, don't stop, don't reverse course. That's the kind of message uh, Japan is receiving from uh, the Quad partners. Having said that, beyond defense cooperation, I'm not sure how much Quad can coordinate uh, their policies, regardless who comes into the Japanese leadership. The Taiwan just followed China in announcing their application to join TPP. Japan is a chair country this year, so Japan will have to deal with this issue, but it's not going to be decided during Japan's tenure. I think negotiations will go on into the next year, and next chair country, Singapore, is going to uh, deal with it. But Japan will have to make its stance. And what will be Japan's stance? My guess is uh, China will not go ahead of Taiwan. You know, Taiwan just jumped in in the right moment, right moment, and made it an uh, important issue beyond the economic uh, weight of Taiwan. So, so that's a big issue for Japan. The supply chain issues, uh, Mr. Richard Katz mentioned, uh, it's a very important issue. Japan hasn't learned the lesson. But nowadays, I think uh, the language is really mixed up uh, between the supply chain and also value chain. And the strategically speaking, the US leaders are you know, bringing up the semiconductor as a strategic commodity and trying to frame the semiconductor trade issue within this, uh, uh, the language of uh, supply chain uh, resilience and so forth. But uh, you know, this is like uh, uh, going back to the 1980s. You know, the US once decided that they will make uh, profits by giving up the memory chips and shifting to uh, you know, the high value uh, logic chips and, and then later into designing of chips rather than manufacturing of chips. And as a result of that, the production network was built in you know, East Asia. Japan was initially leading, but the leadership gradually shifted to uh, Taiwan and, and South Korea. And, and China is a mere follower of producing uh, cheap commodity chips. And you know, trying to punish China, but with a really simple you know, the trade sanctions and so forth, the collateral damage to the Japanese and Korean and Taiwanese companies will be substantial. And the US leaders haven't really spoken to those issues so far. And bringing up the semiconductor in a quad meeting, I mean, Australia and India have very little to do with uh, you know, high-tech uh, semiconductor chips. So uh, it's sort of misguided attempt. Uh, I should stop here, my clock's saying so. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sato. Another uh, very a um, uh, lot of lot of questions to follow up there on the on the external front. Um, Bryce, um, I, I need a bit of um, guidance from you. We've, yep. We want to get through an, a number of questions from the audience. Uh, uh, how, how do we handle it now? How how about uh, we just go to questions from the audience? We were going to have a bit of a conversation. We'll go to questions from the audience. And Alan, if you have any questions uh, that you want to ask, just dive in. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'll moderate the Q and A. Uh, for those of you <clears throat> watching out there, can you um, uh, can you type in any questions that you have through the Q and A function? And we've got the upvote. Um, uh, uh, function um, enabled. So if you see a question you like, click on it and it'll float to the top of the pack where we may or may not answer it. Um, so I think I'll go with the most popular question at the moment. Um, uh, and it's and it's back to Yoichiro. Um, although Haruko, you focus on this a bit in your research as well, I know. Um, uh, and um, I mean, you've talked a lot about, uh, uh, about um, Japan's external relations, um, Yoichiro, how do they factor into domestic politics? I mean, do the, the question is to what extent will security and related is, issues such as territorial disputes with China and close relations with Taiwan, with Taiwan play a role in the upcoming general election? So not just what those issues are, but are they, are they quote unquote, politically relevant um, to the election? Okay, uh, the territorial dispute is not going to be uh, politicized in election. I think all <coughs> candidates have an exact identical position. It's Japan's and no question about it, period. And if you diverge from that, uh, I mean, you, you basically kill your own candidacy. But, you know, in the broader foreign policy issue, the, so far, the debate haven't shown much difference, especially, uh, you know, the mainstream candidates are not speaking uh, very clearly about uh, a lot of things. And I'll take the example of a missile defense. And Takaichi came out and she said Japan should uh, allow the United States to deploy uh, intermediate range ballistic missiles on the Japanese soil. And well, you know, US hasn't officially requested, and uh, the other candidates, uh, you know, brushed off, brushed off Takaichi by saying that, uh, you know, there's no point in discussing, uh, you know, a hypothetical question like this. So I think the security issue will not come to the forefront before the election, but after the election, I think the missile defense issue will resurface. It was put on hold for the last one year, as I kind of predicted in East West Center uh, webinar <laughs> one year ago. And but it will resurface. Yeah, Haruko, do you have anything to say about that? <clears throat> nothing, nothing really to add to uh, Professor Sato. Um, I think it's more important to focus after the election and how. Uh, in, you know the, the liberal the LDP as a whole uh, intends to whether to follow in you know Abe's line, uh, Prime Minister Abe's sort of foreign policy line, security policies, or um, try to do something a bit different. And um, in particularly, there are some outstanding issues besides um, uh, the territorial disputes or Taiwan, which I think it needs some uh, sober discussions. However, um, I would really raise the point about what are we going to do with Korea? I mean, Korea-Japan relations is, is really, um, people seem to be entrenched in themselves in thinking that, well, you know, there's no way of uh, improving relations, but the Koreans also have a, a general election, uh, a presidential election next year. So, and it very much depends, uh, you know, with the U, particularly in terms of the hub and spokes, the relationship with the United States, uh, that um, how Japan comes out of this uh, bilateral relationship that's been besieged uh, by these uh, 
the let forced labor issues and uh, the the comfort women issues um i think these are very significant and it really needs to be in the purview of uh, whoever becomes prime minister next great um i think i might stick with you i saw one that was where was it uh yeah i'll stick with um haruko but rick you might want to uh, address this as well whether regardless of whomever is elected uh prime minister of japan it will be the first time that that prime minister will be born after the 1960s and of course that's five years after the formation of the ldp does the is the ldp ready for a new generation to overcome the party leadership especially the millennials of japan <laughs> um, <laughs> um i think if the the you know if they're serious uh, and if they want to survive they don't have any choice they have to be um and it's not about you know let's get a young leader <clears throat> and, you know koizumi shinjiro or, or you know kono taro but i do think that um the this uh, if if they want to have remain the dominant conservative party then yes it's not about are they ready they have to be and i think the, these the four candidates that we have this time round is at least some indication that um, the party, some people in the party at least know <clears throat> that they have to sort of get a new generation going. Um, because if if you remember, you know, Suga-san's cabinet, it was like, I felt like, um, you know, when I was say, you know, in elementary school in, you know, in the seventies or, you know, or the eighties, when all of the you know the ministers were stuffy you know middle age or sort of you know men in the 60s not middle age actually um and it was shocking to see this display of of you know all this complete insensitivity towards uh you know diversity not even like gender equality but just this, I don't know how to say it, <laughs> but um, yes, it's not about are they ready? If they're not, then um, we will have a, a very unstable, as Sato Sensei said, uh, a rather unstable sort of a political situation for, for some time, maybe two or three years. I don't know if, if Sato Sensei agrees or anybody or break. Okay. Yeah. Uh uh, Rick, if you've got, have you got something to say on that? Because I've got a question. Yeah, sure. Why yeah. not? Okay. Um, I think the generational change in Japan is one of these under the surface uh, tectonic shifts that has not made its impact felt in politics. You see it in the economy, for example, younger people, particularly those with special skills, uh, there are many of them, much more than in the past. They don't have this ambition to work for some big prestigious company their entire life. They want more than want to get on the ground floor of a growing company, of a new company. And the way that you see the, imp the, gen the impact of generations and other things is, as Haruka said, it's, it's not that, well, she pointed this out, the low turnout. But the, what I want to say about is what, what is the, what's the significance of that is that the LDP has stayed in power, not because people like it, although for a while people were thrilled with Abe's rhetoric of, of Abe Namak's recovery. It stayed in power because there is no viable opposition at this point. And so people simply do not vote. But in several elections, when somebody was actually raised a credible, a credible <clears throat> uh, alternative, the vote turnout really, really rose. And a lot, a lot of these people who turn out are urban-based, younger, some of them are women, uh, et cetera. Now this occurred in 2009, when the DPJ, the, the opposition party, the Democratic Party of Japan triumphed with a very, very high turnout. In, when they, they failed, totally failed to, to run the country in a way that the population found credible. And the LDP under Abe had an equally significant triumph, but the LDP triumphed with fewer votes in its victory in 2012 than it had in its defeat in 2009, which is the people who came out to vote because they were enthusiastic about the prospect of change 
been vote again in 2012. I think the DPT, I think the LDP leadership, much of it believes that it could continue in this path of winning by default and does not have to change. I think they're very, very stuck in their ways. Uh, and there are individuals in the party who want to do something different, for which Kono is one, which is why the faction leaders don't like him. But whether uh, uh, Haruka says they have to be ready, uh, well, they, I, I would amend that to say they ought to be ready. And if they're not one day, they could face a cataclysm like they did in 2009. But whether they in fact will obey that imperative, I think that's very, very much undecided. And that, and who actually wins the election this time will be one indicator. If Kono does very, very well in the, in the first round, but does not get 50% of the votes, and the Diet members decide to choose somebody other than the, the one that people wanted, that to me is an indication that they haven't yet awakened. That's uh, that's right. Um, I, I think I think that's correct, and I think um, I think I mean even if he does win fifty percent, they'll st and, and or even if he doesn't win fifty percent, and they still choose him, there's going I think a lot to be a lot of politics um, around factional contestation, um, and yes. and that's going to affect his ability to lead. I mean, if he wins the if he wins the first round. Um, he's a popular prime minister and he can sort of assert himself. Although it has to be said, I mean, Abe came through the second round um, and was quite a strong leader in his own right. Um, and on that point, there is a question here from Ricky Kirsten that I'll take a stab at. She asks, to what extent can you see the proxy battle for influence in the LDP between Nikai and Abe behind the dynamics of the LDP presidential race? Um, now, for those of you who don't know what that is. Um, Nikai is um, is Toshihiro Nikai is a very powerful uh, broker in the LDP. He's been the um, secretary general for a long time, and there's a battle over the position of se secretary general within the LDP because, of course, the secretary general is a very influential figure. Um, it's the secretary general that can raise political donations. It's the secretary general that. Um, that, that can ultimately choose who gets to run in elections. And that's more important than it has ever been, um, uh, or, or it's, it's been more important in the last, uh, last two or three decades because, um, because previously um, the LDP had, um, or, or, or Japanese elections were fought over, um, over multiple candidate districts. So the LDP could field, field two, three, five, right, um, candidates, um, and it wouldn't wouldn't be such a problem because you could you could have you know two or three LDP candidates in one district winning. Incidentally, this is um, this is this also explains the rise of factions because the LDP candidates were competing against one another and they had to coordinate the vote. Um, but now, since electoral reform in the 1990s, we've had single member districts. Um, and that ability to choose who gets in has become all the more important. So there is a, a battle going on between Abe, Aso, and, um, and a guy called Amari. Uh, well, there was. I mean, Abe and Aso were trying to put Amari in the secretary generalship. Um, and Nikai... Um, was resisting them. Now, I think Kishida wanted to get rid of Nikai. Um, is that correct, Yoichiro? You seem to be nodding. Yeah. Okay. And um, and and so that will play into the race, right? It'll be it'll be Abe and Aso supporting Nikai versus maybe whoever else it is, um, either being silent on who gets to be the secretary mm. general or not. So all of these factional dynamics are happening behind the scenes. And they're going to create loyalties um, uh, between the politicians and the faction heads, and that's going to affect um, uh, uh, the, I think, the prime minister's um, ability to lead going forward. Um, okay, let's see if there's another. And that was that question, by the way, was from Ricky Kirsten, who. Um, who actually introduced me to the Australian Institute of International Affairs, uh, 
by telling me to write an article for Australian Outlook. So that's kind of why I'm here, I guess. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, let me. I've got, I've yeah. got a question. Bryce, oh, you got your hand you. up. Yep, yep. yep. Yeah. Um, and uh, and let me let me echo uh, your thanks to uh, to to Ricky. Thank you, thank you, Ricky. I didn't I didn't realise there was that uh, connection there. Look, I didn't want the um, the the, uh, the webinar to to end without uh, my asking um, uh, Richard Katz the hard questions that I've promised him because he. Uh, the the presentation was uh, was a, a very daunting uh, um, series of challenges, uh, Richard, particularly around growth and uh, and uh, and inequality uh, in Japan. But in a throwaway line at the end, you said, "But these are all soluble. Uh, it's just a, a a matter of how." So for a country like Australia, which is uh, you know r really you know has a deep interest in, uh, in Japan continuing to be a vibrant economy in the world. Um, I, I'd just like uh, sort of an overview from you on, uh, on what, what needs to be done and whether it will be done. Sure. Um, thank you uh, for that question. Um, you know, if you look at the resources that Japan has, its primary resource really is its people. It, it is, I think, second or third in the world in the number of, of people, say, 25 to 45, who have a college degree. It is third in the world in terms of, if you overlook, you know, the patent flooding, you just have a proper measure of patents in terms of, of, of patent, production of technology, production of, of new ideas. The application then by businesses is no longer what it used to be, but it was pure technological prowess. It's up there. You have an educated workforce. It's very attractive for foreign companies to come there if they were, if they were able to, to buy Japanese companies, which they can. So it has these resources. There are very, so that, that, and that they've always had. You have a younger generation, which is a very, very different mindset than its previous generation. That has both positive and negative consequences. One of the, on the positive side is one I mentioned before, which is that you have people who've gone out in the rest of the world and, and have, have experience, and a lot of them are either founding new companies that challenge the old people, or the older companies, that is not the old people, older companies, or, they, or they're willing to go to work for them and get in the ground floor and do something exciting with their career. They're not the people who, who needed the security because they grew up going to school without, you know, without shoes on or hated their job and were bored with it, but saw no alternative. So, the, so not the majority, the majority become even more cautious, but there is this rising uh, minority. The entire gender relationship situation is, is, has become a double-edged sword. On the one hand, you know, in the 1986 Equal Opportunity Law, Japanese women were promised equal opportunity in promotion and employment. Um, the law is not enforced, but they were promised it. And so they flocked to these four-year colleges where previously they were relegated to these two-year colleges whose purpose was to make you attractive in the marriage market. And so they went to college expecting careers, which they didn't get. Well, they, the talented ones, are flocking then to these newer companies. And you walk into one of these offices and you see women managers around, which you just do not see at the, at the old fogey companies. Um, one thing is the Japanese government could simply enforce the law, which is equal pay, equal promotion for equal work, whether you're male, male or female lines, but also around regular and non-regular lines. Um, the, one of the big issues is technology. You know, the Japanese Companies are very, very adept at the pure technology, but because they've operated in such an insular fashion, that we're going to do everything ourselves. They've not been able to take advantage of the tremendous power of, of the new technology. Why, for example, Sony, why is not Sony a world beater in cell phones? Where's the Sony tablet? What, what, these are superb companies which have not been able to adapt. And they really need to learn new ways, and they will do so most if they face competition, both from foreign companies coming onto Japanese soil, but also new challengers. And, and finally, there's the force of globalization. 
Uh, if you look at the people who are found creating exciting companies, so many of them have global experience. For example, Rakuten, which is the, well, actually Amazon has now beat it out as the largest e-commerce mall, but it was Rakuten. When Mikitani, his father taught at Yale, he himself got a Harvard MBA. When you talk to these young entrepreneurs who are in their 20s and 30s, so many of them have gone to Stanford or a guy created Zozo Town and he's a billionaire, he retired at age 40, he's just a billionaire. He had this experience of living for a year at Stanford. The, the guy who's number 25, the one self-made person on the list of Japan's richest 50 is a guy who founded Mercari. It's an, it's an online flea market. He spent a year after leaving one company, spent a year traveling all around the world to gain experiences around the world. So these people have a very, very different mindset so that underneath the surface, there's all kinds of very, very exciting social changes. I'm actually finishing a book on this topic, a little plug there, sorry. But, um, but it has not made its way into the, the, the leadership politics. It's not, there's not been either a political party or a faction of a party which has taken on this constituency and moved with it with, maybe Kono is looking at that. I just don't know enough whether he is someone who would know better, but some of his issues speak to this, to this generational and other social changes. And it's certainly not made its way into the powers of, of big business and Kadon Ren. But one, and now I'll say one final thing and then stop, which is it's very interesting that Kadon Ren is so backward on the issue of climate change. So 400 leading Japanese companies, household names, including by the way, Sony, formed their own group to push aggressive climate changes. And they had met with Kono and said, you know what? We're not going to be able to produce in Japan in 10 years because people in other countries are saying they won't buy from us unless we're 100% renewable, like Apple. So we're going to have to move our factories out of Japan. Our factories in Europe can meet those conditions, but not in Japan. If you want us to stay in Japan, you've got to respond to this global process. And so globalization is also a potential force for, for progress so that it's very easy to design a scenario where these things congeal and we have an op, uh, uh, the optimistic turn in Japan. It's even, unfortunately, even easier to design a scenario which Japan once again misses an opportunity. But the potential is there for a good outcome in a way in which I don't think it's been uh, in, in, in say 20 or 30 years, precisely because of these social, these social changes, some of which Haruko spoke to earlier. So that's my, the grounds for optimism. Thank you. Or at least hope. Okay, fantastic. Right, we, we are uh, sort of coming to the end. I did uh, promise we'd end up at uh, 2.20, but we do have a call here from somebody who's called Adamu. I, I know who Adamu is. He's one of the contributors to the Mutant Flop Frog <laughs> blog. Anyway, um, Adamu asks for a prediction. What is your call for who will win the LDP presidential election? Um, or what's going to happen? <laughs> Yoichiro, how about we start with you? <laughs> so you are forcing me to make predictions. Indeed I am. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I was quite astonished by the development in the last two, three days during which Kishida really lost steam. And, you know, now she's uh, matched by uh, Takaichi in terms of uh, the percentage of support among the, the parliamentarians. And this is really a fatal for his candidacy. You know, if he cannot retain the second during the first round and fourth to third, then, you know, although the pr present factional kind of implicit backing by faction leaders, it, it's going to go back to zero. It's going to be voided. And the second round will be a whole new ball game. And Kishida is not going to survive if he comes in third during the first round. So 
I would pay a closest attention to this match between Kishida and Takaichi, and also their margin trading behind uh, Kono in the first round. Uh, I'm still not making a prediction, am I? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Haruko, do you have anything to add? Um, no. I, I, I think it's going to be Kono. It would be very good. Everybody knows it would be the best. <laughs> and I think, uh, and I, I, I thought it would be Kishida in the very beginning, partly because it's, it's like a safe, uh, <laughs> if not boring, uh, candidate. But, you know, Kishida is moderate. He's savvy. He's, you know, he's got the aura and everything. Um, but um, I think it really could be Kono, which won't be bad. But, um, I'm not betting anything on it. <laughs> Rick, any any predictions? Well, I, I don't like to make predictions about the future. Uh, I'd rather make them <laughs> about the past. But having said that, and this may be wishful thinking. Um, well, let me just say this: if they were if they were a, a strong opposition party that the LDP had to worry about a month after this selection, then it would be Kono. I, I think to, you know to win the election. Since there isn't, I think they feel the leaders feel free not to put Kono in there. Nonetheless, I'm going to make wishful thinking, but the le more likely option may be that uh, the scenario that you outlined, which is that Kono does manage to become prime minister, but he's unable to really dominate the party in the way that Abe is a personality so dominated the party and really got his own people there so that um, Kono isn't quite Kono. And uh, that, that may be the, uh, the option. On the other hand, you know, he may be people fool us. No one expected Koizumi to be as dominant and he had been dismissed earlier as a kind of a flake. And so one never knows when these things happen. So I think the most interesting, let me predict this, the most interesting outcome would be for Kono to win and for him to really act like with the powers that Conte, that the, the prime minister's office can have if he chooses to use them and uses the power of, of the TV and Twitter to really dominate the party. That would be an interesting outcome. Yeah, that, that I'd agree with that. So um, for what it's worth, my two cents is that it's going to be Kono. Um, but even if it isn't, um, the fate of the next prime minister um, is going to be um is, is going to hang on on whether or not he can dominate the factions as you've said rick but also whether whether and you'll you'll note that i've already used he so i'm counting uh takaichi out um about whether whether they the prime minister um can also put up a good fight in the general election that has to be held i think in november um i didn't want to give anybody the impression that general elections don't matter um, because it's going to matter if if there's a honeymoon period and the the public are in love with say Kono and he wins big in the general election that that bodes well for him in terms of mm -hmm. factional politics. Um, the internal LDP polling is not looking good. Um, there was an internal internal poll that said they might actually lose their. Um, majority, they won't lose government because they're in power with um, a sort of eternal coalition with the Kome Dol. Uh, there's been a few questions, including from Zara Kempton um, about the, the Kome Dol. Um, but that just that just adds another factor, another thing that he has to deal with in terms of his negotiation strategy. And then it's going to be very hard to avoid um, a sort of system where we might have revolving prime ministers, revolving door prime ministers going forward. And as we know, the last time we had revolving door prime ministers in the LDP was the period uh, between 2007 and 2009. And that was the prelude to um, the opposition winning. Um, because although Rick says, Rick is correct, I think that um, in terms of dominating the uh, the general election, the um, the opposition parties aren't particularly strong, 
but actually the uh, Constitutional Democratic Party of Japan, which is the main opposition <laughs> party, has about as many seats as the Democratic Party of Japan had going into the election. They've adopted a strategy where the Communist Party and the other parties of the opposition are trying to stay out of each other's um, districts when they when they run. So, you know, I, I don't think they'll be a very credible force in the election coming up, but, you know, give them time, you might see something happening in the next election cycle. Right. Well, that has, uh, we've gone over time. So, um, Alan, I'll, uh, I'll pass things over to you and you can send us off. Yeah, well, thank, thank you very much, Bryce. And, uh, and thanks to all the, the panellists uh, for, uh, for that discussion. As I said at the beginning, this is a more consequential uh, election for uh, for Australia than many uh, than than many people here think, and uh, I think we've certainly come away uh, from from this with a much better sense of who's in it and the challenges that they uh, they face. There's plenty of room for uh, for retrospectives, uh, um, you know, in in 12 months or so on what uh, happened. So. Let me thank everyone uh, for all of you for uh, for attending the webinar, and let me particularly thank uh, our panelists uh, today. Thank you, and goodbye. Thank you.